Let's stand and sing our opening hymns.
At this time, I would invite the children to receive our offering for the Pelican Fund. This is our last Sunday this month to receive offerings to be used at the Oswego Correctional Facility. The children chose this uh, particular mission project. They will be providing art supplies for mental health activities for the inmates at the Oswego Correctional Facility. Also, I would ask uh, all of you in the congregation to please have your hymnals out. Turn to page 191 because we will be using that song in just a little bit. Eli, can you show her where the pelican is? Okay. That money's going to be used to get art supplies, and that will help people who need to do some art activities to improve their health. So this morning, I need all of you to look over here where I'm sitting. And you heard a little song that Janice plays when you receive the offering. Anybody know what that song was? Were you listening? Da, 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 da. You remember, Carolyn? Jesus loves me. How many of you know this song, Jesus Loves Me? Few of you do. Well, we're going to see if we can sing that together today. And to help you remember the words, we're going to do some sign language. So that's why I need your eyes right here where I'm sitting so you can watch and do the actions with me. Okay, the first word is Jesus. So we're going to tap our palm of our hands with our finger. That's to remind us how Jesus had nails put in his hands when he was hung up on the cross to die. So this is Jesus, and Jesus loves, so you give yourself a hug, loves who? Me. So you point to yourself. Let's try that all together. Jesus loves me. Now the next line is this I know, so we're going to tap our head because that's where our brain is, right? Our brain helps us think and to know things. So let's try those first two lines. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible. So for Bible, we pray and then we open like a book. For the Bible tells me so, little ones. So act like you're counting some little kids next to you because this is the word for child and we have, we're all children of God. So little ones to him belong. They are weak, but we are strong. So we can do this for strong. Let's try that much together. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. All right, I'm going to ask Janice to play and everybody to sing with us, and we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me this I know sing. Let's gather up for a circle for prayer. Okay, your little finger there. All right. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. 
And we say, thank you, God. We appreciate all the things you've given us, and we thank you for each of these children that are here today. We thank you for Jesus, who loves us and is our friend and never leaves our side. We can always turn to Jesus because Jesus loves us. And be with each of these children as they enjoy some playtime this weekend and as they go back to school. Protect them and bring them back safely. Amen. Do we have children's church today? Is there somebody doing children's church? If not, there are some bags out there. You can get an activity bag to sit in your pew with. Okay? And you can go back to your families.
to give God glory through our praise, our singing, our music. I hope that you enjoyed that, uh, a little different than what we usually do. And Jamie tried to pick from the list of favorites that you all submitted when we did the survey a few weeks ago. And we will do this again one of these times. And in case you were wondering, the reason I had you turn in your hymnal to page 191, I intended for us to sing the second and third verses of Jesus Loves Me, but we'll do that next week. We don't often sing beyond the first verse, so we will do that later. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. To the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. After fleeing Egypt where he's wanted for murder, Moses settles down in Midian. Many years have passed since he left Egypt. He's married now to Zipporah, they have a son together. The king in Egypt has died. There's a new ruler in his place. And the Israelites are groaning under the heavy burden of slavery, crying out to God for help. God hears their cries and remembers his covenant with the ancestors, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God has a plan and is ready to answer their cries. Meanwhile, out in Midian, Moses is tending his father-in-law's sheep, taking the flocks out in the wilderness out to Mount Horeb, which is sometimes called Mount Sinai. And the name Mount Horeb means where God appears. 
Now, if you were a Jew sitting in the synagogue listening to this story read from the scroll, that word would be a big clue. You would know something amazing is about to happen. Now, try putting yourself in Moses' sandals. He's going about his daily business, watching over the flocks, making sure they're grazing properly, keeping an eye out for predators. And suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he sees this very strange and peculiar sight. There is an angel of the Lord coming out of a flame from a bush, and the bush is not being burnt up. So he stops in his tracks, and he goes over to investigate and see what's going on here. The bush is on fire. It's crackling and popping, and Moses can smell the smoke wafting through the air, rolling upward. But the bush is not consumed. Moses is puzzled by what he sees. He's irresistibly drawn to go over and investigate, and so he comes closer. Close your eyes and imagine yourself as Moses. God's voice calls to you, Moses, Moses. And he answers, here I am. God says, come no closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Pretend you're Moses. If you're able, slip off your shoes. Plant your feet firmly on that floor in front of you. Wiggle your toes. You can feel the softness and the texture of the carpet. You are on holy ground. We are here in the sanctuary where we praise and worship God, where our words of our Lord's Prayer that we say together rolls out across the airwaves through the universe. The candles flicker on the altar, reminding us that Christ, the light of the world, is present here with us. We are on holy ground. God is here in this room. God is with Moses on Mount Horeb. God is so powerful and mighty, almighty and splendid. All those words we sang in our songs today, Moses hides his face because the belief is that if anyone looks on the face of God, they will not live because God is so wondrous. God speaks directly to Moses. He tells Moses, I've got a job for you to do. God wants Moses to bring the people of Israel up out of slavery into a land of milk and honey. Now, does Moses feel worthy of this call from God? No. He objects. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, the mighty king of Egypt, to bring these people out of slavery? I'm not worthy. God answers back, I will be with you. Does this reassure Moses? No. <laughs> but Moses said to God, Moses again resists God's calling. How will these people know that this is for real? You say you're the God of our ancestors, that you're the one who is sending me, but tell me, what name should I give them? I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God says, this is my name forever, my title for all generations. A biblical commentator points out that this answer that God gives Moses is sort of like what parents get out of a teenager. Where are you going? Out. In other words, I'm going where I'm going. It's an answer, but it seems rather circular. And so we wonder, is God playing a little joke on Moses in this conversation, or, or is God just being mysterious? Or is he trying to say, I exist, and I am with you always, for all time? The dialogue takes a turn here and continues to be a call from God and a response from Moses. And if we were to read beyond today's scripture for 24 more verses... We're going to get this back and forth going on. 
Moses raises all sorts of objections to God's calling him. I can't do this. Suppose they don't believe me or listen to me, but say the Lord did not appear to you. Well, that seems to us like a pretty sensible objection. I mean, imagine if you were to go home and tell your family and your friends, I spoke to God today. God appeared to me in a burning bush. Would they believe you? They might be checking you into a special hospital. We get where Moses is coming from. God says, okay, you think they'll need proof? I'll give you proof. Take your staff and throw it on the ground. And Moses does this and it becomes a snake. And God says, now pick it up by the tail. I'm not sure I'd want to do that, but pick it up by the tail and it becomes a staff again. And God says, Moses, put your hand inside your cloak and then pull it out. And his hand is covered with a horrible skin disease. And he says, now put it back in your cloak. And when Moses takes it out again, it's fully restored. And God even gives him another proof, a third one, in case the first two don't do the trick. But still, Moses objects. I can't speak with eloquence. I stammer and I stutter. And God promises, I'll give you the words that you need. But Moses pleads with God and says, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Wow. Don't you think God might be getting a little irritated at this point? Sure enough, God is angry. And can't you just hear the tone of voice when God tells him that, Fine, your brother Aaron will be your mouthpiece. And I will give you the words, and then you will teach Aaron what to say, and Aaron will speak on my behalf and yours. We're totally justified in calling Moses the reluctant prophet. He argues with God. He resists God's calling. And this seems to be typical in our Old Testament readings. Think about Gideon. He required several proofs before he was willing to answer God's call to him. Or how about Jeremiah, who believes he's too young? He says to God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Moses feels unworthy and inadequate. He's reluctant to speak to the Israelites and the Pharaoh. When we read the Bible, it seems that many of God's great servants hesitate and have to be convinced before they will respond and say yes to God. We are also full of excuses. I'm too old. I don't have the skills that are needed. Find someone else to do it. Other times we simply don't recognize God's voice and so we fail to hear the call. It reminds me of a woman that I knew years ago. We were at a membership care committee meeting at the church and she came in one evening and she shared what had happened to her recently. She'd received a newsletter from her previous church before she had moved to where we were. And in the newsletter, there was an article about how this church had started a prayer quilt ministry where people made quilts and then they were prayed over and then given to the people who were in the hospital or students going off to college or somebody who just really was in need of comfort and prayers. And she described how she was intrigued by this article because she also was a quilter. And she said, I set the article aside on the counter and I went off and did other things. And then after a while, I came back and I picked it up again and I read it. And she said, and then I put it in the trash and I went off to do my business. And she said, and then the next day I was walking past the trash basket and I reached down and I picked it up and I looked at it again. So then she pulls it out of her purse and says, this is the article. Do you think God's trying to tell me something? And the whole group in one voice said, yes, God is talking to you. Are you listening? Well, she did listen. And she began a prayer quilt ministry at our church. And this quilt that's up here on the altar is one that she made that was prayed over in worship services. And it was brought to me when I had my knee replacement at the end of April. When I wrapped myself in that quilt, I can feel God's love transmitted through human hearts 
and hands. And I could tell you many other wonderful stories that have been a result of her answering God's call to this ministry. And I know there are people in this congregation who have heard God's call and have answered the call. Here's the thing, though. We get a choice. God does not coerce us. We get to choose how we respond. God desires God's kingdom to be built here on earth. But it requires our participation. God will bring the people of Israel out of Egypt, but it requires human agency to effect that will. And because we have the freedom to question, resist, or choose to obey, oftentimes God's will is not carried out. And we can see that in our world today. There are places that are in chaos and shambles because people have ignored God's cry for help. God's request for us to do something. People turn a deaf ear to God. We love to sing the song, Here I Am, Lord. Whenever I sing it, I feel like I should take off my shoes because the words and the melody, it speaks of all that is holy. But I'm also reminded that it's the final refrain that is critical. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will go. This is what my, Moses finally said to God. I will go. In the end, Moses accepts that he can trust God, that God will provide whatever is needed for him to answer that call, to carry out that mission, to accomplish God's will. Where God wills, there's a way. Perhaps God has been tugging at your heart to do something. Maybe it feels like it's something small and trivial, and yet it would make a world of difference to someone else. Or maybe it's something gargantuan, but you're just hesitant to take the first step. This week, pause in the busyness of your daily life. Turn aside from your path. Take off your sandals. Experience God's presence and listen for God's call on your life. And be ready to say yes. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power, send us grace. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, Listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us door's gonna swing open and the walls come a-tumbling down when the people of the Lord get down to pray 
sharing our joys and our concerns with one another. If you have a joy or concern, if you'll raise your hand, the folks will bring you in. Lonnie, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if the ushers will come forward to receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
I just don't know which way. A city uh, of a city, city called, called heaven. heaven, and I'm trying, trying to, to make, make heaven, it, make, make heaven, heaven my, my home. Sometimes, Sometimes I'm tossed down. Driven Sometimes I just don't know Don't know which way to turn Oh, I heard of a city Of a city these gifts to you we ask that you would dedicate them and bless them for your use here on earth that they might be magnified and put to glory in your name amen please turn now to our closing hymn i'm gonna live so god can use me on the screen or page 2153 in the faith we sing believe in our hearts.
and that what we believe in our hearts we may practice in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. By putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee, Galilee. Every time I look into that holy book, I want to tremble. I want to tremble. When I read about the part where a carpenter cleared the temple. Oh, yes, he did. For the buyers and the sellers were no different fellas than what I profess to be. Look in the mirror now, and it causes do, me do, shame do, to do, find do, Still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, and you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. My mama taught me how to pray before I reached the age of seven. And when I'm down on my knees, that's when I'm close to heaven. Well, Daddy lived his life with two kids and a wife, and he did what he could do. And he showed me enough of what it takes to get you through. You gotta put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee, Galilee. Put your hand in the hand, in the hand, of the the hand who still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Put hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Now take, take a little look, look at yourself, look at yourself and you can look, look at, at others differently, differently by putting, putting your hand in the hand of the man from 